I have prepared some, some illustrative cases. There is no correct answer to these cases, so we don't have voting paths. If you don't mind to raise your hands, if you want. Huh? Uh, as I say, every case has w only one diagnosis, but many others as are possible. So these are my disclosures. And let's start with case number one. He's a 48-year-old male prior injection drug users, diagnosed of HIV in 1992. Uh, he had had um, esophageal candidiasis, and currently he's on raltegravir, abacavir 3 tc this is, uh, These are his um, serological profiles. S antigen negative, uh, C antibody negative, um, uh, HCV antibody positive, but HCV, uh, HCV RNA negative. He was a spontaneous clearer. His PPD is negative. In July, was referred from patient due to fever, malaise, anorexia, and weight loss uh, uh, over the last tw two months. Physical examination, he had generalized adenopathy, liver and spleen enlargement. The lab saw pancytopenia uh, and raised uh, and a mixed pattern with elevated uh, AST, ALT less than 10 times the upper normal, but also elevated alkaline phosphatase, GGT, LDH, and a low albumin. His HIV markers, the CD4, were 157, Three months earlier, we were above 300, and he was fully suppressed. Uh, HIV viral load was fully suppressed. And the CT showed thoracoabdominal adenopathy, multiple small nodules in lung, liver, and spleen. So in your opinion, what's the more likely diagnosis? Who thinks that is number one? Raise your hands if you want. <laughs> Somebody there, OK? Disseminated mycobacterium Avian disease, lymphoma, okay, a lot of people think it's lymphoma, and leishmaniasis, no leishmaniasis, okay. So it was biopsied, and as many of you, it was a Hodgkin lymphoma, and the diagnosis was provided by an ingular lymph node biopsy. This is to illustrate that uh, we are talking about viral hepatitis, but we, in a daily basis, see patients in the full range of HIV disease. We have late presenters, we have patients that are low to follow up and present in an advanced stage. We also see patients coming for abroad, for abroad, and just to remember that the hepatobiliary complications in patients with HIV is broad and include not only viral hepatitis, but also opportunistic infections, neoplastic infiltrative liver disease, ju just as the case I show you, AIDS cholangiopathy, drug-induced liver injury, and uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Diagnostics test, besides liver blood test, that is going to be the main topic of my talk, but uh, sometimes we must relay, of course, in microbiology test, imaging, and liver biopsy. Case number two, this is a 45-year-old heterosexual African male diagnosed in 2006. He has negative uh, HCV serology, a negative surface antigen, and he had successful vaccina vaccinations for hepatitis B and for hepatitis A. He's currently in Darunavir, FTC, TDF. Occasionally, he used uh, cocaine. On March, his CD4 uh, count was uh, about 300 and fully suppressed HIV viral load, normal ALT, ACT. And in July, he was admitted to another institution due to a lacunar stroke arterial hyper hypertension, and he was discharged on low dose acetyl salicylic acid, lisinopril, and atorvastatin, 80 milligrams. He is receiving darunavir, ritonavir, FTC, 3TC. And when he comes to, um, uh, to our clinic, he's asymptomatic, he's fully suppressed, his CD4 are, are fine, but we see uh, increased elevation of ALT and, and AST, these levels. So what do you think is more likely diagnosis? Acute hepatitis C, somebody thinks it's acute hepatitis C. Okay, it could be. Acute hepatitis A body, 
drug-induced liver injury. Most of you think that this drug-induced liver injury and hepatitis B flare. Nobody. Okay, so this was a drug-induced liver disease due to atorvastatin, and the patient had normal, rapid normalization of enzymes following atorvastatin discontinuation. The ultrasonography was normal, and the HCV RNA was, was negative. Okay, just to emphasize that uh, this is a recent uh, study coming from South Africa, a country in which we would expect uh, a wide range of, of, um, of pathological findings. But just to emphasize that near 40% of these cases, when they were underwent uh, a liver biopsy, were due to drug-induced liver injury. So addressing the topic of the talk, liver blood tests, just to remind you that transaminase, alkaline phosphatase, and bilirubin are markers of liver injury, not liver function, although bilirubin is also um, a marker of, of, of liver function. And as you know, ALT is a more specific marker of hepatic injury than AST. What about albumin, bilirubin, and prothrombin time? They are markers of hepatocellular function. The problem is that they can be influenced by extrahepatic factors, for example, malnutrition, etc. And elevated uh, alkaline phosphatase, isolated, can be confirmed the hepatic origin just by elevation of, of, uh, uh, of GGT or by fractionation of alkaline phosphatase. Marion told that in her talk uh, some minutes ago, what are truly normal liver chemistry tests? So normal ALT ranges from 29 to 33 for males and 19 to 25 for females. This is according uh, um, these uh, practice lines from the American Gastroenterological Association. Also take into account that a normal ALT level may not exclude significant liver disease and you can have a patient with liver cirrhosis and a normal uh, ALT. There is a linear relationship between ALT and, and B, BMI and also the upper limit uh, normal can vary between different labs, but just take into account that the normal values are the ones uh, outlined before. What are the patterns of liver blood test elevations? We, have, we can have three patterns, hepatocellular, in which there is a disproportionate ele elevation of transaminase in comparison with alkaline phosphatase, a cholestatic in which there is a disproportionate elevation of alkaline phosphatase in comparison with transaminase and a mixed pattern in which you have very high elevation of both. So how to tease this out and to solve this? You have this R ratio. This R ratio is this simple equation in which you put um, the relative elevation of ALT divided by the uh, elevation of the normal of alkaline phosphatase, and you come out with a number. If this ratio is above five, this is a hepatocellular, it is below two, is cholestatic, and mixed pattern is between two and five. This is an easy. And just to remind you, isolated hyperbilirubinemia is, is, a, is a common finding and mostly is due to Gilbert syndrome. Another case, this is a 25 year old MSM from Eastern Europe, comes to Spain, he goes in May uh, last year to his general practitioner asking for a, a HIV test, it turns out positive. The initial elevation, his CD4 count is about 500, a low HIV viral load, normal transaminases, and he has negative antibodies to hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and also uh, to syphilis. On June, when he was appointed to start therapy, he uh, suffered abrupt asthenia and jaundice. He had eptomegaly, and he has this high elevation of transaminase, above 10 times normal, and also high elevation of bilirubin, and, and GGT. So what do you think is the more likely diagnosis? Acute hepatitis C, acute hepatitis A, some cases, good, syphilitic hepatitis, 
too much. <laughs> and acute hepatitis B. OK, so A and B, half and half. So it was an hepatitis A. Hmm? He had a positive IgM, and he had negative results. The RNA HCV was negative, and also the uh, surface antigen was negative. Just to show you, this is what happened in Madrid at the end of 2016, along the 2017 and 2018. We have this large outbreak of hepatitis A, as many other countries in Europe. And the yellow, the, uh, the yellow, I mean, each bar represents a week. In green, we, you, you have um, green are males, uh, red are females, and blue are pediatric cases. And our patient had the hepatitis A, where the yellow uh, bar, the, where the yellow arrow is. Another case. This is a 14-year-old heterosexual African male diagnosed in 2007. He has chronic hepatitis B, E antigen positive, negative antibodies of hepatitis delta, negative antibodies for HCV, and he, uh, and he has positive antibody to hepatitis A. On February, he was on darunavir, ritonavir, FTC, TD, TDF, his CD4 were almost 500, fully suppressed HIV, normal transaminase, fully suppressed HBD DNA, and uh, uh, liver stiffness below 5 kilopascals. In November, he came to the clinic and he, he said that he was off therapy for four months because he traveled to his country, to Nigeria, and he didn't take the meds. He was asymptomatic, although he had slight jaundice. Uh, the labs show that a slight decrease in the CD4 cell count, a rebound of HIV RNA, and you see uh, an hepatocellular um, or a mixed pattern with elevated bilirubin and transaminases. So what do you think is a more likely diagnosis in this heterosexual African male with hepatitis um, B, an acute hepatitis C, an hepatitis delta superinfection, syphilitic hepatitis, or hepatitis B flare. Good. <laughs> Very learned. <laughs> so it was hepatitis B flare. It was confirmed, uh, and all the other tests came negative, and the patient eventually get suppressed, and, and his labs normalized with therapy. So um, the causes of elevated transaminase uh, these are a list of, of causes uh, highlighted are the most common among HIV-infected patients. So of hepatic origin, ALT higher than AST, the most common causes are chronic viral hepatitis or acute viral hepatitis, drug-induced liver injury. It can be due to prescription and over-the-counter drugs, herbal products, and also supplements, uh, NAFLD, steatosis, or NAS, acute vile duct obstruction of any case, and sepsis. You also can have elevated transaminase of hepatic origin uh, being AST above ALT. And this pattern normally is seen in alcoholic liver disease, cirrhosis of any etiology, ischemic hepatitis, and congestive hepatopathy, patients with uh, congestive or right-sided heart failure. But don't forget that you, you can have elevations of transaminase due to non-hepatic cases, skeletal muscle damage, normally rhabdomyolysis, whatever the cause, and cardiac muscle damage. The magnitude of transaminase um, is not the same. For example, chronic hepatitis C normally is, is rarely above 10 times the upper limit uh, of, of normal, and usually is below two times the upper the upper limit of normal. In chronic hepatitis B, a little bit higher, but except in exacerbations, it's rarely, rarely above 10 times the upper limit of normal. NAFLD normally is less than time, the four times the upper limit of normal. Alcohol-related alcohol liver disease, as I mentioned, normally you find out that AST is more elevated than ALT, and you have 
acute viral hepatitis or drug-induced viral uh, drug-induced liver injury with jaundice or ischemic hepatitis in which you can see very high um, concentrations of AST and ALT. Another case, this is a 42-year-old MSM diagnosed in of HIV in 2004, uh, A3. He currently, he's in Dolutegravir, 3TC, Avacavir. He is fully protected against hepatitis B and hepatitis A because of vaccines. He suffered a primary syphilis episode in uh, 2009, and February this year, being asymptomatic, he came to the clinic with, uh, well, well-controlled HIV, CD4 above, above uh, 1,000, fully suppressed, and elevations less than 10 times normal of ALT and AST, with a positive test for syphilis, 164. Six months, it was negative. So what's the more likely diagnosis? Acute hepatitis C, who thinks this is acute hepatitis C, this case, for the one case, one, I mean, one, one person. NAFLD, syphilitic hepatitis, most of you think it's syphilitic hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, there is no mention. Well, it turned out that this was an acute hepatitis C, and this gentleman, that he's a professor in a, in a university, he, well, told us that he had chemsex and the, he used IV methadone and he had this positive serology, positive uh, RNA, genotype 1A, he has, and he underwent therapy. So this is, think about these cases. Yep. I mean, syphilis and uh, both, yes, syphilis and an elevation. Both, both, both. Yeah. both. I mean, it could be syphilis. Sometimes you can see this in syphilis, but it, it turned out there was an acute hepatitis C. So uh, just to mention, this is a, a nice work from um, a group in Spain. Antonio Olveira is a gastroenterologist. They put together a large number of patients in which HIV patients with sustained viral response, HIV positive and HIV negative, and they analyze persistent altered liver tests. By definition, is any increase of ALT, ACRT, GGT uh, um, at SBR12 and SBR24, excluding those that had any other known underlying liver disease. About 1,000 patients were included, mostly males, median age 53, 39% cirrhosis, 57% HIV positive, and persistent altered liver tests were detected in 12% of the patients, 9.4% in mono-infected, and 13.5% in co-infected. Many of these patients underwent a liver biopsy, and it turned out that the main etiology was NAFLD, 36%, alcohol, 23%, and drug-induced liver injury, 15%. And the baseline variables independently associated with persistent alternative liver test was a prior diagnosis of cirrhosis and also uh, liver stiffness. Mm -hmm. So probably the worst, mm, the more advanced cirrhosis, the more odds or chance to have this persistent alternative liver test. This is one of the last cases. This is a 44-year-old MSM diagnosed in 2003. Uh, he's, I mean, he never had problems with HIV, and he is fully suppressed and with high CD4 cell counts, real pivotin, FTC, TDF. He's in a stable monogamous relationship. He denies high alcohol intake, and he has, I mean, he was successfully vaccinated against hepatitis B and hepatitis A, but had negative HCV. The current problem is progressive gain of weight, Actually, his BMI is 36, and persistently elevation of ALT, ACT uh, between 75 and, 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 and 50 units per liter. He also has impaired fasting glucose and hypertriglyceridemia. So what do you think is the more likely diagnosis in this individual? Drug-induced liver injury, 
NAFLD, non alcoli fatti di versi, of course. Hemochromatosis, autoimmune hepatitis, who knows. Ok, so, um, an ultrasonography was performed and so increased hepatic echogenicity. There was some discrepancy between, you know, the non-invasive test, F4, NAFLD score, and the TE. So we performed a liver biopsy that showed uh, a steatosis of more than 50% of the hepatocytes with absence of inflammation or fibrosis. Just to remember that massive elevations of transaminase above 2,000, uh, 10,000, normally you see that in ischemic hepatitis, uh, drug-induced hepatitis, rhabdomyolysis, and heat stroke. These are common causes in which you see massive elevation of transaminases. And also, don't forget that, uh, well, some of these patients get into trouble, acute liver failure, and you must think uh, that you have an acute liver, or the patient has acute liver failure. Uh, when the liver tests are very high, hepatic encephalopathy and prolonged protombin time. You, you remember that albumin takes some weeks in order to low, so with these three parameters, you can suspect acute liver failure. So what? Do guidelines, after this review and these cases, what do guidelines recommend us about workup and management of persons with elevated liver function tests? Well, these are the European guidelines. This is the algorithm, three steps. Well, in the first step, actually, is exclude medications, exclude alcohol intake. The second step makes an emphasis in excluding viral hepatitis. You can address, I mean, this, you can reach easily this in the in the EACS in the EAX, um, web page and finally when everything turns out negative you have other things to think about steatosis nodular uh, regenerative hyperplasia other viral diseases non-hepatic and strange causes of uh, transaminase and rare disorders and eventually the patient may need a liver biopsy there are nice guidelines, easy guidelines, such as this of the American College of Gastroenterology, published uh, two years ago. You also have uh, these also very simple and nice uh, guidelines from the British Society of Gastroenterology in GUT this year. And also in up to date, you have also uh, a nice uh, a chapter devoted to the evaluation of HIV infection with hepatobiliary complaints. So just to summarize before, the interpretation of a normal liver blood test in HIV and in other contexts, the importance of context, as we have mentioned, the clinical pattern, the extent of the abnormality, and the duration of abnormality. And just about a few, uh, some words about the comprehensive care of patients with chronic liver disease. As with other chronic disease, it's important uh, to have an informed and activated patient able to collaborate in his self-management. Also, mm, harm reduction mm, initiatives. You can I mean, inform about the potential of transmitting uh, hepatitis or to acquire hepatitis. Uh, weight, um, a, a healthy weight, exercise, and nutrition. This is key, not only to NAFLD, that is essential to cure the disease, but it also helps uh, with other chronic diseases. Of course, alcohol and tobacco, tobacco and marijuana, for example, you, we have proof that can enhance fibrosis progression in chronic hepatitis C. It's very important to screen and immunize because something that is normally not as serious such as hepatitis A can be a very serious uh, disease in patients with, uh, with chronic liver disease. It's important the medication management those reductions, particularly in patients with cirrhosis. Bone issues, you know that, for example, hepatitis C and normally cirrhotics have a high incidence of osteopenia and osteoporosis, and also our patients, we have special surgical risk. About monitoring, progression to cirrhosis, and in those who already had cirrhosis, don't forget screening for hepatocellular carcinoma. There are also specific management of cirrhosis, such as CTs, uh, prevention or therapy of variceal bleeding, encephalopathy, whatever, liver transplantation, and at the end, patients with end-stage liver disease are not 
for liver transplantation. So uh, don't forget about palliative and end of life care. Okay, and that's all. Thank you for your attention.